Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. Thank you for joining this Community IT Podcast Part 2. You can find Part 1 in your podcast feed if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome, everyone, to the Community IT Innovators Webinar, Security Training for Nonprofit Grantees. Whether you're a funder or an IT person or a grantee yourself, we're glad that you're here and we're looking forward to sharing this case study about the Legal Services Corporation and their work over the past year to ensure their grantees have the training to spot phishing emails and be able to protect their organizations. My name is Matt Eshelman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Community IT. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Uh, my name is Carolyn Woodard. I'm in charge of outreach at Community IT. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker and practitioner, Jada Briegel from the Legal Services Corporation. Jada. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Legal Services Corporation is the largest funder of civil legal aid uh, for low-income Americans in the nation. Um, we were established in 1974. We operate as a nonprofit. We get an appropriation from Congress and we distribute more than $420 million annually to 132 grantees around the country. I have been the CIO at LSC for five years, and I'm thrilled that we are able to offer free cybersecurity training uh, to our grantees and all of their staff, and really look forward to the discussion today. Yeah. Um, actually, a follow-up question um, that I had is, you know, one of the things that we often hear is, well, how do you get executives to, to take this seriously, right? It's often viewed as, well, security is something that, you know, I'm going to make other people do, but I, you know, executives, I can't get that done. How have you approached that, you know, at your own organization um, in terms of, you know, what is the expectation around training uh, for your own, for your own staff? So the sad thing is when something like a BEC happens to you, um, everybody knows how important it is. When you start losing money, it, it's just like the forcing function. I had very good support before that, um, but it has even increased. In our world at LSC, uh, we do phishing tests every month. If you fail, you get remedial training. It's only 15 minute training, but it makes people sit up and say, oh God. We also, um, I have a security person and he tells them sort of what, what they should have seen in that email that they should have known it was phishing. Um, every year we do regular testing. Um, you have to get it done in the, the month of October or else I cut you off the network. Um, it's amazing. It's fantastic. We, this is from my DOD days. Like we would totally <laughs> do stuff like that, but, um, our management is totally on board with this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that's a great example, um, because I think you said a very, a very high but achievable bar to say, yeah, like this is serious, this is important. And, uh, you know, you do it internally and I think, you know, have reasonable expectations for, you know, for providing and expecting it to be, um, you know, completed by the organizations that you're funding as well. Those are great questions. We have some questions coming in from the audience as well. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of them to you. And also, I just wanted to mention to everyone on the webinar, please use the Q&A um, function to submit a question for us. So the first question that came in was, are there consequences if someone falls for a real scam? So you said, Jada, at your organization, you you had an actual business email compromise. Um, and I don't know if he means that there are consequences, like do people get fired or what are the other consequences that can happen? So I, I think it depends on your organization and it depends what happens. Um, what happened at our organization, there was an investigation. Um, there was, you know, what, how did this occur? Um, was the person negligent? that person no longer works at LSC. Um, there were real consequences. And I don't want everybody at LSC to be scared. I want them just to be heads up aware. Um, and 
I think they are. I get 10 emails a day to my help desk saying, is this real? I don't care if they send a hundred. I want to see them all. Um, we'll tell you if they're real. Um, and so that, I mean, there are consequences, real consequences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would just kind of add in, I know we did um, you know, a webinar specifically on um, cyber fraud with uh, your part-time controller. And again, they shared uh, you know, a, a similar story where, you know, kind of a targeted business email compromise, you know, took an organization for I don't know, large sums of, of money. Uh, and again, through the investigation there, the, the, the problem it is not in the fault is not with the user clicking on something and being kind of scammed into it. Um, you know, it was in kind of not reporting it and being, you know, the cover up is, is, is the, the crime. And so I think, you know, in cybersecurity, you know, as Jada mentioned, you know, the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And so if there's ever any question, absolutely send it, ask for help. I think that's part of building um, an effective uh, cybersecurity culture and just feel like you can ask your IT team or ask your IT provider or ask your colleague um, to take a look at it. Because I know from reviewing, you know, the security tickets that we respond to, we can see pretty clearly where, you know, somebody submitted a message, they said, you know, I didn't click on this, but it looks weird. And then, uh, you know, a week or two later, we get an alert that their account has been compromised. And so if we would have known that they actually clicked on the link and maybe they entered their password, um, then we can take appropriate actions. And so, you know, not being sure is not a bad thing. We would so much rather someone call us and say, I just clicked on something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what's happening, but I think something's bad. Something bad is happening. Because we know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, we had something happen a couple of weeks ago. We were like, okay, once we figured out what had happened, turn your computer off. We're changing all of your passwords. Um, we're going to send a FedEx. We're going to take your computer. We'll get you a new one tomorrow. Um, it was that bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not something I think is so good about this kind of training is like you said, Matt, it kind of sensibilizes people to report it right away instead of trying to like there it's maybe you're embarrassed about it and you're like, oh, I think I can fix this myself. And it's like, no, you need to bring it to people's attention. Um, so we have a bunch more questions coming in. One is what do you think about using YubiKey versus the single sign on method? So that's mm -hmm. kind of a specific one. Um, yeah. So I would say. Uh, so YubiKey would be, that's like a physical security uh, token uh, that would be part of multi-factor authentication. Uh, so again, multi-factor authentication, something that you know, which is your password, along with um, something that you have, which again, for most organizations, probably like an app on your phone, maybe you're using text messaging, um, but YubiKey or a FIDO security key is like a physical um, device. So I would, again, it's a little bit of a, we're in the technical weeds here, but single sign-on just means that you can get into multiple uh, applications with one kind of user credential. Uh, and as much as you can protect that you know, user identity, kind of the better off you are. It's something that, you know, I've had physical security keys for quite a while. We're now kind of deploying those across our organization um, because uh, again, they just kind of increase your level of security because they are uh, nearly impossible to spoof. Or if you were following the Uber uh, hack results, you know, the, the way the bad guys got in there were to basically just keep trying to log in and the text, you know, phone kept going off with an MFA request and they, the hacker knew who they were and they called them on WhatsApp and said, Hey, respond to this. We're trying to test something. And they clicked okay to finish the MFA request. And then the bad guys got in. So uh, that's, you know, an almost impossible thing to do with um, physical security keys. So uh, again, if you're going through a multi-factor authentication project, yeah, I would totally look at um, incorporating FIDO keys or security keys as part of that um, because, you know, you get better protection than uh, just a mobile app. We have a couple of questions. Thank you, Matt. We have a couple of questions that are a little bit more specific. Um, so I just put in the chat feature, um, the page of our site where you can uh, get in touch with Matt directly if we have some, or if you have a question that you asked in the Q&A and that we, we don't get a chance to get to it today, trying to be mindful of time. 
Um, so we had an interesting uh, question here. How about international organizations that are having difficulties in IT? Is there a possibility or are there training processes to be able to understand which messages to respond to or not? Um, so I know no before is it's a specific tool that you need to sign up for and have a license uh, to. Do you know, Matt, of any more um maybe some free versions or just websites that have information on email phishing scans in general, that would be helpful. Um, so I would say in terms of free trainings and there are kind of free resources available, I would, you know, stay safe online, which is a U.S. government um, resource, I think provides some good foundational information uh, that organizations can get started with. Um, I would say, you know, for organizations that are looking for paid trainings, particularly if you're multinational, I do think, you know, know before, and I assume other security awareness training tools have multilingual, uh, you know, trainings and again, test phishing messages as well. So you can provide, uh, you know, language appropriate uh, stuff, right? It's not all US, you know, English centric, you know, there are platforms that will support uh, and send those messages in whatever, you know, geographic location and, and language that you, um, yeah, that you need to use. Sounds good. Thank you. I put the um, Stay Safe Online uh, link there in the chat. Um, someone asks, what is the number of clicks phishing email failures within a particular period of time that should be allowed? Like, is there a rule of thumb for this type of a tool or for no before specifically? I was wondering if we were talking about for an individual or for the organization. For an individual, it's zero. Um, you click, you get more training. Um, because in the real world, you click, you could be taken to all kinds of bad places. Um, for the organization, Matt, you probably know what sort of click percentage is, is you know, should be your goal. Yeah, I would say at an organizational level, again, we we had the metric on earlier. I think, you know, we see kind of high high teens uh, is kind of where most organizations are whenever they come into a training. Again, between 10 and 20 percent of messages will will kind of get get clicked on, um, you know, over time. You know, we see organizations, again, we are typically doing monthly test phishings, uh, you know, kind of ongoing and that rate typically goes down. Uh, to the low single digits, again, depending on the size. I want mine around five or six percent. <laughs> yeah, so that's, or lower. That's, yeah, that's typically where where organizations get to, you know, after you know ninety, one hundred and twenty days um, in a training program. So kind of low single digit um, percentage wise. And then in terms of how you're, you know, handling that um, interaction with with staff, you know, click it on once, fool me once, you know. <laughs> um, but I think if somebody, you know. I think our goal is to, again, provide training and education so folks know what to look for. Uh, again, this is not kind of punitive or designed to be punitive, but designed to be educational. Um, you know, but I think, again, you can identify those folks that maybe are your frequent flyers and then maybe require some additional attention beyond just, um, you know, some, some additional online training. Again, there may be some other elements that need to go into that. If you've got somebody who's perennially clicking on things and also maybe in a position where they maybe have access to, uh, you know, a, you know, finance or HR uh, type positions, I think would be particularly sensitive there. So two more things that we do, we don't require grantees to do that. this, but just internally, um, our accounting staff gets an extra training each year because they're really, I mean, people go after your accounting team, anybody that can release money. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is every so often you do get that person that clicks through, you know, you do monthly testing like three times in a row. I wait till about three times and then they've already gotten remedial training. Then I go to their supervisors and say, I need a little help here. I'm not sure what's going on. If they're just like, they have too much to do and they're just rushing through things. But I, I need some, I need your help on mentoring and educating. I think that was great the way you put it, Matt, is that like one, like the first email that link that you click on that goes to the wrong place it's not like it builds up and it gets worse over time. Like the first one can, it can be the worst one. So um, having that, but encouraging that 
that community of um, reporting it, knowing who to turn to, who to report it to, what to do, I think is so um, is so great about some of these tools. Um, so there's another question. Will there be a move to zero trust? I'm not totally sure what that is. So Matt, can you explain <laughs> yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. So, I, answer it? <laughs> I mean, this is, I feel like zero trust is one of those like buzzy terms that gets thrown around a, a lot in the cybersecurity world where essentially uh, zero trust is, means you're always going to kind of re-authenticate and verify uh, the, you know, the user is who they say they are. So again, you know, in, in a kind of our old school come into the office world, right? Like once you log into your computer, you're in the office, you know, you have access to everything in the office. Zero trust would say there needs to be some kind of continuous evaluation process to verify that nothing has changed. Uh, and you are, you know, the the correct person act that needs to have access to these systems or, or, or um, processes. And so zero trust is this kind of framework that we're, we're always going to uh, kind of re-authenticate or re-verify uh, the user is who they say they are. So again, um, you know, the Uber breach is a good example. You know, they they had, uh, you know, VPN, multi-factor authentication that was able to be compromised. Then once the threat actor was on the local network, they were able to just get access to other systems because there wasn't, you know, an additional verification Uh and they were able to find, uh, you know, a network script that contained some embedded credentials. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was no, again, additional process to verify, uh, you know, access on that system. And so the, the threat actor was able to, to get in. So again, zero trust, you know, I think it's largely a mark, you know, kind of seems like a lot of marketing buzz. I think it's helpful to kind of think through like practically, what does that mean for your organization? You know, how often are you going to you know, re-authenticate people? What are the tools you're going to give them uh, to do that? What are the different checks that need to be in place? So uh, again, security is often about a balance. You know, you could have a super secure system where you had a notepad in a, in a closed room, right? Very secure, but nobody can really get to it. Can't do much with that. Uh, so I think there's that balance in terms of providing authentication and uh, making sure people can, you know, get access. We want to make, uh, yeah, security easy to use in its kind of default configuration. And from a from a nonprofit perspective, I have so many basics that I need to get better at and get in place and put money into. Zero trust is like it's this government wide, very um, lofty goal that I can't get to yet. I have a little follow-on question though, because I feel like this part of the discussion touches on that tension between the convenience and the ease of using it for your staff to get their work done. And like Matt, you talked about at the outset with all of the competing priorities and maybe somebody is just going really quickly and they're just like, I got to answer all of these emails um, versus you know having that security in place. So Jada, maybe you could answer for your, in your experience with this project, um, that tension, how do you feel like you navigated that tension of making it easy to use, um, but making people have to use it? I feel like there's a base level of what you have to do. Um, so cybersecurity training is a base level. And if you think about one hour a year that you're spending reminding your users um, about the potential problems that are out there. And it's not just for work, it's for their personal life too. Um, this stuff comes to you in your personal email too. I think it's worth it. You need, uh, you need executive buy-in to say, yes, you're gonna do it. You know, I've had the first year I did it internally, there were people that were like, oh, I'm, I'm really busy. I'm on all these trips. Um, we give you a month. You can you can take an hour out of your work days that month. So I, I think there's just you kind of just have to do it. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I, I agree. There's no there's no silver bullet, easy pill. You have to just put the time in and realize how how dangerous it is to your organization. And I just want to go quickly back over our learning objectives. I think we hit them. 
um, at, uh, you should be able to describe the cybersecurity landscape for nonprofits, um, why cybersecurity uh, awareness training is important, uh, email training particularly, at the anti-phishing email, and how effective is security awareness training. So we talked a lot about that. And um, we answered a bunch of Q&A from the attendees. Thank you all so, so much uh, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you again so much for coming. Thank you, Jada, for sharing this case study with us and your experience. Um, thank you, Matt, for answering our questions about how to do this training and how it was working in this project. And um, thank you again, all the attendees, for, for joining us for this hour. Thank you for joining this Community IT Podcast Part 2. You can find Part 1 in your podcast feed if you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community, and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website, www.communityit.com, so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders, and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.